Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Conversations on Conversations, where each week we explore a topic to help us have more powerful conversations with ourselves and others. I'm your host, Sarah Noel Wilson, and joining me back is my dear friend Neha Sampat, where we will be exploring how to support yourself and how to support others who might be experiencing a chronic illness. But for those of you who haven't uh, listened to Neha's episode from last year, let me tell you a little bit about her. Neha Sampat Esquire is CEO and founder of Belong Lab, where she creates cultures of belonging into which everyone can bring more of their true and best selves. Through consulting, speaking, and writing at the end intersection of inclusion, well-being, and leadership, she helps organizations address hidden barriers to belonging, such as internalized and unconscious bias, toxic positivity. Boy, we need to do a session. We need to have a conversation on that. Maybe that'll come into play here. (laughs) And wellness challenges. She's an internationally sought-after expert on inclusion, leadership, and disrupting imposter syndrome. And she runs the top-rated Owning Your Value programs to cultivate evidence-based confidence and nurture authenticity. And I'm going to continue because I want to give you the full like gamut. So in her work, Neha leverages her experience working as an attorney at both large and boutique law firms, her tenure as dean of students and leadership professor, and the joys and struggles of mamaing her two kiddos. Neha's insights have been featured in Harvard Business Review, Time Magazine, Thrive Global, and numerous other professional publications, podcasts, and media. Neha holds a BA in sociology and political science from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, obtained her JD from UC Berkeley School of Law and received her certificate in graduate applied psychology. Neha works across industries from Microsoft to Pixar and UC Berkeley to Leadership Council on Legal Diversity. And I'm and I'm so excited to have you back on the show, Neha. Also, just for those of you who are interested, Neha's episode um, from last year is still one of our top I think you're like number six, like top episodes downloaded when you and I spoke on imposter syndrome. That uh, is so cool. I got to share something back with you. Yeah. Um, I have a wonderful, amazing uh, person working with me at the moment who's going through a lot of like the past podcast videos, Mm. like all sorts of, you know, essentially content that we've created. And um, last I spoke with her, our conversation was her fave. Aww. So she was like, oh, there's so much in that. So um, there, they resonated it's... with a lot of people on a, on a deeper level than I think um, we often, we often allow ourselves to engage in. And, yeah. uh, you know, I certainly feel that way when I listen to it again. So I'm so excited to be back. And I'm so I- excited to get to talk with you, Sarah. You, you have, you are, you are, a, you have a gift. You are a gift. Wow. See, we're just going to be like periodically pausing and smiling and like getting a little like misty eyed because it's been way too long since we've been able to connect. So, uh, you know, just welcome everybody to Neha and Sarah time as we as we reconnect. (laughs) Um, Well, you know, talking about the imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one of the gosh, it's still like, I get goosebumps, not in a good way, but I get like a really visceral reaction when I think about that insight you brought, which is, right, we struggle with imposter syndrome when we're working in an environment that wasn't built for us. And I can't tell you how many times I've quoted you or shared that. And, you know, uh, people of all kind of, you know, shapes and sizes and experience will just pause and, and I can see the shift from them thinking there's something wrong with them yep. to realizing the system wasn't made for them and just this sort of release of possibility it it's it's always just hits people so powerfully of oh it isn't there's not there's nothing wrong with me yeah yeah i think you know now there's so much talk about the terminology around it, like there's, you know, Mm. this whole like anti imposter syndrome campaign. Some of it is like, it doesn't exist, which I disagree with. Um, And some of it is like problems with the terminology, like the clinicizing, I'm now probably Mm. creating a new Mm -hmm. word. Yeah, Um, I like it though. Right. And, but you know, I, I always say 
we all have different experiences of how language, you know, hits us. And mm. for me, when I first heard the term imposter syndrome, there was something about syndrome that actually comforted me. And I think it's part of what you're talking about because I was like, oh, this is broadly enough experience that it's actually called a syndrome. Like yeah. it's not just me. That was, that was completely life shifting for me to kind of realize that what I had been living with my whole life and much of my professional life was a thing, like a quote yeah. unquote thing. So I think that's such a huge part of it. I mean, I think it's one of the most uh, profound steps we can take towards addressing self-doubt within ourselves and with one within one another is to just normalize it, you yeah. know, and to realize that not to compound our bad, the bad feelings it makes us have with the guilt of it's my fault. I have this. It's, yeah. it's not your fault. Yeah. It's system. It's just, it's systemic. It's systemic. It's systemic. That needs to be on a shirt. Just it's systemic. Oh it's systemic. So right. I mean, that, that like could apply to so many, to so many, to so many things that we so talk true. about. So, okay, Neha. So we're talking today and, you know, everyone who's listening, you're going to, you will hear more about Neha's journey, but start, start us back in your journey of navigating chronic migraines. Yeah. Um you know, I know that I when because when you and I first, I, yeah, I just I want to hear the like your journey to this point, and then I want to dig into just what what that experience has been like. What's it been like from a standpoint of of uh, your own resilience and navigating? What has that meant for people who are supporting you or not knowing how to support you? Right. So we'll dig into all of that, but 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 take us back um, and help us understand what your journey has been navigating chronic migraines. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, and I want to just say first, uh, what we said off air that I think needs to be said mm. on air, which is, thank you for creating space for this conversation, because societally, we do not create space for these conversations. And whether disabilities and um, diseases are apparent or non apparent, they are further invisibilized when we don't create space to talk mm. about them. So I really think that just even having this conversation and providing access to this conversation is a huge step in the right direction. So thank you. My journey, um, I will tell you this. I am still, I am still figuring out my journey. I'm mm. still on the journey of understanding how did I get here? Um, so I, I'm a little, I'm kind of sharing. I may realize things about myself as I'm sharing. It's going to be like a therapy session. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay. I had episodic migraine, like really, really sporadic episodic migraine. Um, you know, most of my life, I would say, um, possibly had like migraine as a kid that was manifesting as abdominal migraine. I, we didn't know what that was then. Um, but I guess that's I, how I don't migraine, know what that is now. Yeah. Migraine can manifest in kids as abdominal pain. What? Yeah. And I used to get these bouts of abdominal pain that had like, there were just mystery bouts of abdominal pain that would come and go. Um, so it's possible that was migraine. And then it turned into kind of the more classic manifestation of migraine as, you know, I got into adulthood, but it would be like a few migraines a year. And they were yeah. like, take an Excedrin. It's, it's fine. Like it was totally not cramping my style, you know? Um, and then this is a little bit hard for me to talk about because I always wonder, like, are my children going to listen to this, go back and listen to this podcast someday when they're grown? So unfortunately, it was having mm. children and the process of having children that for me, chronicized what was an episodic disease for me. Um, so we think it was hormonally, the hormone shift actually pushed the migraine to become chronic, but they're, they don't know a lot about migraine. There's a dearth of research, um, on migraine, especially because, you know, it's a disease that is mostly suffered by women. And we see sure. sadly, you know, gender bias play out in what, what research is funded, funded, but that's for another podcast episode. Um, <laughs> you know, we can, yeah, we can we bring can it in here. <laughs> systemic, systemic, <laughs> systemic. systemic. Can yeah. we just, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, um, started to have daily migraine after I stopped nursing mm. my first child. And then when I became pregnant with my second child, it went away. When I stopped nursing the second child, daily migraine returned and the severity of the migraine was much 
higher to the point that Excedrin couldn't touch it. And so it took me a long time to make my way to the right doctors. I shouldn't say make my way because it wasn't on me. It took a long time for the system, the system to the system to send me to the places that actually could help me. You know, it was all like this, there's this whole experience of being disbelieved um, as a woman, as a woman of color. Um, There's the experience of minimizing that I experienced both directed towards me from the medical profession and also coming from me. This like self gaslighting, this like, it's not so bad, just push Mm. through it, Mm. it'll get better, mind over matter, you know, and so I kind of languished in some way, even though I was doing a lot to try to get this treated. Um, It took some years before I was finally sent to a headache clinic, um, which specializes obviously in, in headaches and was, then I was misdiagnosed for, I think a year or more and put on a daily medication. That's not good for you and ended up being the wrong medication. Mm. Finally, um, switched doctors got the proper diet, what we think is the proper diagnosis of chronic migraine and, um, have gone through different eras in treatment. It took a few years for the right treatment to be found and for it to work. And then I had a glorious, maybe two years of not having daily migraine of feeling like having pain-free days, which was, Mm. Oh my gosh. I mean, I swear my neighbors would see me skipping around the neighborhood on my daily walks because I was like high on not being in pain. I was literally, Mm. I felt like I was Mm. high. Um, and so it was, it was just a glorious window. And unfortunately that window closed December, 2019. And since then I've been back to daily more severe, um, migraine and we're still trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's happening. So the journey has been. Um, very, very kind of, it's been very difficult throughout and it's become more and more of a psychological journey. Uh, as time has gone on, I learned this term chronic illness burnout and I was like, holy shit, I totally have that. I totally have that. And so there's all these, uh, aggregate pieces like once you add up all the parts the sum is much greater than the parts and that shit has been hitting the fan for me particularly over the past year and a half year or so that like my body's been breaking down from the stress from the experience of chronic pain my psych you know my mental and mental health has been breaking down it's taken a different toll as i've been on the journey of reckoning with it in a more honest way with myself and in a more honest way with the world around me yeah there's um uh, first i'm so grateful i'm so grateful that you're here and willing to share so honestly and gosh i have so many there's so many paths that i'm curious about so first i want to i want to start because i know there are people who are likely listening who maybe have never experienced a migraine mm. and and that point you made uh, uh, at the front of our conversation about is particularly when a disability is invisible yeah how much that can be dismissed or minimized you know whether it's because of your lived experience or because right like as a, a woman mm. a woman of color going to the doctors and um just so help us understand for those who haven't and you know and i i sit there and i think i remember in college I would get them really bad. And then I don't want to like knock on wood, the Mm -hmm. magical thinking, but um, haven't. Mm -hmm. But how do they manifest for for you? Or how would you Mm -hmm. describe what they're like to navigate day in and day out? That's a great question. And I'm in the process of trying to ungaslight myself, which is which I'm not actually through with. So I'll, I'll do my best but I may not be getting it all truly accurate because Mm. I've been in survival mode and in survival mode, we do whatever it takes to, to get by. And sometimes that does mean minimizing, you know? Mm. Um, so I'll tell you what happened recently. Recently I got a new treatment. Um, and it seemed to, it's not a permanent treatment. It's a temporary treatment. It actually seemed to make it, it, it did. I really believe it made a huge difference. Like it really, it helped me cross the line between not living and living, which is Mm. everything. Right. And so I had about a month 
of feeling better. And by feeling better, I don't mean that I didn't have magically all of a sudden didn't have migraine every day. I still had daily migraine, but I'd have one or two days a week that it was severe. And the rest of the days, it was like truly mild. Mm. And a realization that I had that's painful for me, emotionally painful, is that now that I saw what truly mild was, there was this whole recalibration that yeah. happened. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, all that, what I was calling mild the past was three not. and a half years, it was nowhere yeah. near, near mild. Yeah. I mean, the amount of pain I've been living with, like I look back and I'm like, I, uh, I don't know how I made it through a day like that. I don't know how anyone makes it through even a day like that. And yet I kept making it day after day after day. So I can tell you, you know, how it manifests for me, but it's such a systemic disease with systemic, it's going to, this is all about the systems, apparently the body system, internal the system, system, societal, yeah, yeah all the of system, it, the system, the system, the system. So, um, I, um, but migraine manifests very differently for different people. So I want to really be clear with everybody that, um, don't take what you hear from me and assume that's how it manifests for other people. It is, a systemic disease that's rooted in a complex neurological disease. Um, so for me, it's changed over the years, but how it currently manifests is, first of all, it's just this feeling of feeling migrainey. I don't even know how to explain mm. it, but I, I realize now that I'm back to feeling crappy again, that mm. I always have this feeling, you know, that it's, that it's always there. It's like almost like an ache in my eyes and mm. that I just get so used to that I don't even realize it's an ache anymore. Um, I realize another realization once I felt better for a month and now that I'm feeling worse again is that I used to say to people, it hurts to move. So movement is a trigger mm. for me, which means like, you know, if I, if I drop my pen on the floor, reaching down to get it would make me feel ill and would, sure. would actually increase my pain or could mm. actually flip, you know, trigger, a head pain um, and other symptoms. So even like bending down. So I, I travel for work as you know, and as you do. So imagine the process of like packing and unpacking, lugging your crap around mm. an airport, going through security, like it's movement, 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 getting in an Uber or a Lyft, the, the motion, like everything makes me miserable. And I had to learn from my pain psychologist, you know, you might only be able to pack for five minutes at a time. Now imagine, wow. imagine, and that I started doing that. Imagine hmm. it if you can only pack, hmm. you, you pack for five minutes and then you lie down for 10. You pack for five minutes and then you lie down for 10. Like that's the nature of the shifts that I'm having to make and I've had to make in my life. That's the, that's the nature of the time we lose, right? Um, how long it might take me to do something because of this illness. So motion's a big trigger for me. And what I realized in the past month that it's not just like my body moving, like bending down to get something. It's actually even my eyes moving, which, mm. you know, in conversation and my eyes are constantly moving. Yeah. Um, so it's essentially constant. It, it's there's pain that can happen on one side of my head and then it can instantly flip to the other side. I get a lot of neck uh, pain and tightness. Um, so I get a lot of pain in those areas. Uh, nausea. Uh, I, one of my biggies is aura. So I, my vision, I become very light sensitive um, to the point that when it's bad, I don't even leave the house because I can't be in the light and also the movement, even just like walking around will make it worse. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'll miss parts of my vision. Like there's pieces that'll be missing. And that happens to me on a daily basis. Um, sure. So I don't even know. I could probably go on and on, but those are probably, probably the biggies, the actual pain in my head and neck, um, the vision. Oh, and just sense sensitivity. I can smell like a super smeller. And sure. smells like make me really, really ill. Sounds really bother me. So there's this heightened sensitivity that happens with that as well. How do you that? I, you know, I, I really appreciate you naming so explicitly like the amount of time. Because yeah. again, you know, I go back to it's not invisible for you, mm. but it can be invisible for the rest of us. And the yeah. thing that I know is you know, through my own experience with navigating chronic mental illness, with yep. working with other people who have various uh, different challenges, disabilities, that you you do become really good at 
to some point masking that people won't like you won't realize that I'm having a conversation with you and I'm in incredible pain or I'm having yeah. a conversation with you while I'm having just hundreds of intrusive thoughts from my OCD or I'm yep. having a conversation with you, right? This and this and this. Yeah. So so I appreciate you talking about just that, like the battery drain, but also just the physical time that it takes. I, I'm curious and, and, and like what your experience is as you're riding these waves of feeling like, oh, I've had a good, good month. And this that like resonated with me because on my own journey, um, I'm trying to like work on like, <laughs> I don't want to call things good day, bad day. Yeah, yeah. Right. Totally, because totally. it's like, it's like, oh, man, I had a good oh couple God. of days. And now it was a bad day. And, yeah. and Nick and I, he's been really good about pushing me on that of like, is it is it a bad day? Or was it just a harder day? Yeah, you know, and so it's like, today was just a harder day to, to navigate that. So what is that? You know, what's how do you respond to those when you because when you've been and I don't know if this is true in your experience, but sometimes I think when you're navigating something chronic and mm -hmm. you have like a good couple of quote unquote good days, right? Yeah. Or whatever. And yeah. then when it, it rears its head again, you're like, fuck. Yeah. Like totally. I thought, I thought I was on and you forget that like, well, that is still progress. Yeah. Right. Like, so what, how do you, you know, what is, how do you show up in those moments when, when you feel like, oh, I think I've, I'm having a relapse or whatever language yeah. you would use? I, I do find it hard to say I've had a good day um, or a good month. And so, let, okay, bring me back to the second okay. question. Let me answer this yeah. one first. Okay, so yeah. my struggle with, with good day, bad day is what you expressed and also what just happened in our conversation where I was like, okay, so I had a, you know, I was feeling better for a month. And, but I don't, but then I had to like qualify it. I had to be like, yeah. but I still had daily migraine. I yeah. still had two yes. days that were severe, right? Yeah. Because right. people are dying. People are dying for me to get better. Yeah, to get over, or to, or, or I would assume it, get over get, it. Get over it. Exactly. Yeah, let's be real. Yeah. Let's be real. Totally. Yes. And so I know that any evidence I give of things going better are heard by many people as I'm okay now and I don't need their help. And that's, that's, the, that is not true. And it's so hard to, I don't have the energy. Like I, I finally am feeling better. Doesn't mean I have like a bunch of spoons. I'm in a massive yeah. spoon deficit and I'm just now not draining spoons at the rate I was. So I don't even have the spoons to be like, okay, but I still have daily migraine and, you know, but I feel like, I have to, I'm forced to express that. Yeah. Otherwise I will not only lose the understanding, the being seen, the, the support I, I need, you know, but, um, I think it's mm. both. I think it's losing being seen and understood for what is really happening for me. And it is losing the support I need. I think it's those two things. So there's that piece of it. So that's, that's one piece of the feeling good part, like saying that I'm feeling good or doing better, that is very complicated. It's just yeah. not that simple. And the world around us wants it to be simple and is going to yeah. push, push, push us to make it simple, to make it more comfortable for them and str uh, struggle, suffering. Those are things that we as a society are very, very uncomfortable with. So that's where I think it's seated. Now, the second question, remind me if you remember. Well, just that like struggling to name something as a good day. Yeah. And like, how do you reckon with when then it goes from? Yeah, when it goes good from like good to, to not to, good. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm in the, I'm in that moment right now because I had that month that was better. And now I'm back to shit. And I yeah. realize exactly how shit, not exactly, but I better see how shitty that shit was. Yeah. So in a way, the fall feels worse because right. I'm like, right. holy shit, like my, it hurts to move my eyes. Like this is not, I am not in mild pain any day anymore. And so it's, um, it, it's one of the hardest things for me with the, the, my experience of my chronic disease and of my uh, disability is how do I, how do I navigate hope, expectations, mm. and despair? Mm. Like, how do I navigate those? And it's 
This I find a lot of difficulty in. This is where we plug in toxic positivity, my friend. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you called it. You knew we would plug mm-hmm. it in. Mm-hmm. Um, that like resistance that society and our culture has to um, seeing the full breadth of the human experience, which includes suffering and struggle for every single yeah. one of us. You know, that discomfort and that kind of push, that toxic positivity push, um, those make it harder for me to live my life in a way that I can mitigate my suffering. Because here's an example. Uh, I hung out with a dear friend of mine who I've known forever. I mean, she just a very dear, dear person who is one of the best listeners, but most supportive people I know. And I hung out with her just as I was starting to go back down that hill again. And I suspected shit. This, this mm-hmm. is not an anomaly. This, you know, treatment is wearing off. I'm going, I, my window is closing. Um, but I didn't, wasn't able to express it yet. Like I just kind of had that suspicion. Yeah. And so, you know, she was asking me, like, how's it been going? And I was telling her, like, it was so much better, but you know, this is a temporary treatment. I could feel worse today. I could feel worse a month from now. Like it will end. The treatment's impact will end. And she advised me, she's like, well, you know, I find it that it's not worth like buying trouble from the future, mm-hmm. you know, like, mm-hmm. cause then I'm even ruining that moment where I'm actually feeling better by worrying about the future. And I was like, yeah, I see what you're saying. And, you know, a little bit later in the conversation, she apologized and she said, mm. you know what? I'm so sorry. I said that I you didn't mean to sound condescending. And I was like, you know, it didn't, it wasn't condescending, but by her, like bringing it up again. And I think she realized there was something that didn't quite align with me on it. Yeah, She gave me a window to clarify. And so I shared with her, the thing is, my friend, I have to be aware that this is going to end because I've learned the hard way that if I just sit here basking in hope and, and don't prepare myself for the eventual turn, the impact that has on my mental health when it inevitably does turn is way bad, way, 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 way bad. I cannot afford that. And so I have to accept this tax of enjoying my Mm. window, you know, to brace myself, because if I don't brace myself, the fall can be fatal, you know, it sounds hyperbolic, but it's not, it's not, it's not. Mm -mm. Well, I think there's a difference between Accepting that things are temporary yeah, and using that as a um, guide to say, I'm going to really savor this mm-hmm. because I know that things can shift and change, which is different, I think, than, you know, what people may perceive as pessimistic, right? Like I yeah. look at that as realistic, right? You know, yes. pessimistic is like, oh, I'm just waiting for the shoe to drop. I know it's going to, right? Like, and you, you get almost into a rumination mode of yeah. wh- when's it going to hit versus just like an acceptance of reality. To me, it's just an acceptance of all of our emotions are temporary. All of our lived experiences are temporary. And so when things are good, then I celebrate it and I go and I say, I try to savor it because I know that it's temporary, right? Yeah. Like just to be present with it. And I, um, and I so appreciate you sharing that example from the standpoint of one, what does it look like to maybe go back and go, I don't, I don't think that, I don't know that I communicated what I wanted to, or I think I did. And then that wasn't actually what mm-hmm. you needed to hear. And um, because that, Oh man, I, I I'm sure you you could list off the things people have shared. Uh, like yeah. just look at the bright side. Oh, gosh. At least you don't have <laughs> oh. right. Like insert insert. Yeah. Just just you know be grateful. Yeah. Oh gosh. You know, but I go back. Gosh, I go back to the the words you used. How do I navigate hope, expectations, and despair? Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head for me, and I use that terminology all the time in trying to explain to people, including my family. I come from a lineage of toxic positivists. And it is really, really hard because me having to be a realist has actually created a wall between me and my family. So I've lost belonging Mm. in my Mm. own family of origin because we just don't connect on this, you know? And, and, And so I'm constantly using that terminology. It's like, yeah, there's a difference between pessimism and realism. And I am by nature a glass half full person. It has not come easy to me 
to become more realistic. It has been one of the most difficult things mm. I've had to do in my life is to become more of a realist. I've gone down kicking and screaming, you know, but I've had to, I've had to become more of a realist. And it's something that, um, I don't, I think you're totally right. Like people don't see it that way. They think you're being pessimistic. I'm like, no, I'm just looking at what's around me and yeah. calling it, calling it what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it comes back to that discomfort with struggle, yeah. that suffering, and also uncertainty. This has been a concept that I've been exploring a lot for myself of just the when am I comfortable with certainty and when am I not? And and, and I think that there's some element of that navigating the uh, uncertainty that you're living, right? Which yeah. So that was something I was curious about, both for yourself, but also in how people show up and, and support you in this. Because when something is chronic and not mm -hmm. uh, acute, there is this uncertainty of what is it going to look like today and how is it going to manifest? And and even I'm sure on some level in your journey, uh, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I don't, yeah. you know, I'm thinking about that through my own lens. Um, and so what what is that journey of navigating uncertainty look like for you? Mm -hmm. And then what does it also look like for others who are supporting you? That's such a good question. Um, and I agree with you. I think Reckoning with uncertainty uh, can be very, very, very difficult. And again, I'm going to blame the system. And when I blame the system, I'm not saying let's just throw our arms up and be like, it's the system. And everyone who's listening can be like, oh, it's not our fault. It's the system. We are all part of the system. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. on all of us, right, to, sh to shake up the system. But um, yeah, I, I think our culture is not built for certainty. Um, certainly the American dream is right. You work hard and you will get X, Y, and Z. And we yeah. know that is a myth. We know that is not true for all of us. Right. And it is actually only true for some of us. And right. for many of us, we don't even have to work hard and we'll still get X, Y, and Z. So it's that myth of the American dream that this country keeps trying to shove down our throats. And we keep trying to shove down our own throats and everybody else's throats that if X, then Y. Then Y, right? Yeah. right. It's the formula. <laughs> it's a formula. Just take Tylenol, you're better. Exactly. Don't worry, you'll never have anxiety in your life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And um, that's not life. I mean, hmm. for worse, that it it makes my life really, really difficult to live hmm. in a in a culture where. There's a premium placed on dependability, reliability, certainty, mm. Mm. Um, and and it also, I think, is a wonderful thing in that there's some freedom in it if you really can embrace the idea that there is no certainty. Um, it also means that there is an element of surprise in life, and sometimes those surprises are not unwelcome. Sometimes they're welcome surprises. Yeah. So there is, I'm not, I don't like to silver line anything. I do not believe in silver linings. I would not wish um, your struggle or my struggle on anybody. Um, but I guess, I guess what I would say is something I've learned in my journey is that um, we can reckon with it or not, but, but, you know, life is by definition, uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. And I think we spin our wheels and I for certain am a type A person. You know, I'm a very like driven person. If X, then Y, um, trying to control what we can. And that's been for me, probably one of the other big challenges that I continue to have to work on, which is where do I find my agency in mm. a situation where I have very little agency? Like first, how yeah. do I even acknowledge that I have very little agency, very little? And how do I um, leverage the agency I do have? And, and my pain psychologist just pointed this out to me when I was actually, you know, talking about that conversation that I shared with you that I had with my dear friend. And she was saying that that kind of bracing myself, that is the, that is where I have some agency, right? Mm, to be able to mm. kind of brace myself and prepare myself is one of those tiny little spots where there's some agency in this moment. And so, I, I don't know the answer That's to interesting. it. I, I wish I did because I feel like I'd have a lot more emotional and mental peace if I did have the answer. But 
I will just say that um, reckoning with uncertainty, which you are faced with in a massive way when you have the illness I have, is a beast. It is yeah. really, 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 really hard. I, yeah, th that that's been that's been a it feels like a um, new to me concept that is such at the core of a lot of mental health challenges, right? Yep. Like particularly anxiety. I I need to go back to you, you said something that just sort of cut through my heart as a neurodivergent person, the the premium placed on dependability and reliability. Oh, just yeah. that damn near broke me, Neha. Like, cause it's, I don't know that I, I don't know that I've ever heard that just stated. So I don't know, just so clearly and, and, um, and I get, and I get why it exists and I get why, right? Like there is such a high premium on it. And, and when that is so prioritized, then people who have different lived experiences or who bring different lived experiences to the table, uh, often will be excluded because they don't fit into that that bucket, so to speak. I just I had to just name that one out how, loud. How That's, do you? I'm curious if you're comfortable sharing. Yeah. Like, how do you reckon with that? You know, because. That that's that's a tough that one that one is not just about work you know that that's about like how you show up for people yeah. and I think it can create a lot of insecurity and imposter syndrome getting back to yeah. what we were talking about originally is like am I a good friend am I a good parent am I a good this or that like because we are I don't I think it's how we define reliability and dependability in our culture that's part of the problem yeah. but I'm curious because. I'm still trying to figure this out too. Like how, yeah. how do you man How do you, how do you deal with that? It's gosh, it's, uh, it's so interesting because, you know, we do so much work around trust and a lot of times people will say, well, if somebody's reliable, I trust them. And then I'll, I'll make some kind of a joke, but not a joke. And I yeah. was like, yeah, I know a lot of dependable assholes. Like, I know, <laughs> you know, like I know people who will get the work done and I don't want to work with them. Right. So let's like dig deeper into this. Yeah. It's interesting because that point of uh, like I'll speak from my experience with ADHD, right? I I do I struggle with time blindness. That is a very mm -hmm. real thing. I'm I'm over optimistic. I think I can do anything and get everywhere in 15 minutes, and yep. nothing will like. It I share that life. part with yeah, you. Okay, yeah. I, I don't know where it comes from for me if it's cultural or what, but I like yes. Yeah, just like I always joke, I'm like, I'm just really optimistic that I'll get there. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then there's the reality of things will be forgotten. Yeah. Um, yeah. No matter how many lists, no matter how much compensating, there will yeah. be things that I, I have more greeting cards that I have bought lovingly to send to people that are sitting in a pile. And so that actually has caused a lot of shame for me, yes. like a lot yes. of shame. And because there is, and again, I'm, I, until you said it, it had I'd never been articulated so uh, powerfully, just that premium. So I, for me, for me, it goes back to that, you know, what is the moment? What is the relationship need? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there are times when, um, you know, so like, <laughs> so I come from a family, I can say this, and I know like my siblings are all, they all help behind the scenes and they're going to be like, yep, <laughs> there's what we call the null time. And the null okay. time like growing up was if the event starts at noon, we're all probably going to roll in around two. Yeah. <laughs> and which is, which is, is fine. And also not fine sometimes when people are waiting, right? Yeah. Like, it's like, what's the impact of that reliability, right? Yeah. What's the impact of my timing to you? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's times when that's necessary to be uh, more on top of or mm -hmm. uh, doing what you can to honor the other person, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I also, I don't know, I think, I think for me, I try to give an incredible amount of grace and go, what's in your heart? Yeah. Like, what, what do I know about you as a person and what's in your heart and what, and not even necessarily like, what are your good intentions? Like, mm -hmm. that's not what I, I mean, but, um, you know, like I'm, I'm not, I mean, I can say this, like, I'm not the most dependable person mm -hmm. when it comes to like tasks yeah, I will absolutely be the most dependable person when you need to be supported yes. and loved, I was and say right. That. Yeah. So it's like so so. It, I I love that question that you posed of, 
And so what, what's the definition? Yeah. And, 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 and to me, it's situational, right? Like what's the, when do I need somebody to be, you know, my, what I need from my doctor is different than what I need from my spouse or my partner or is right. different than, and so it, it is something that, that I wrestle with a little bit, especially when we're working with people who are in positional power and authority Yeah, and, you know, and also just like, like navigating cultural differences, yep. you know, like, some some cultures we work with, and when they say we'll get it tomorrow, it could be three weeks. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's not wrong. You know what we and call? So, you know, we call null standard time in my yeah, culture. Well, we call it Indian standard time. Okay, yeah. got it. So there you go. Like it, Indian <laughs> yeah. people are notoriously, we're just you know different about time. Our relationship yeah. with time is different. That's so funny. Yeah, and I think when we add that into this conversation of from like the standpoint of like the expectations we put on place, the, yeah. the, what, the, um, what we clarify is like in the workplace as good performance, as mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of people get shut out. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, or they're not given the, the space they need. I think that, you know, one of the things that I, I, you, you've mentioned and, and you've talked about, you talked about it with your, um, uh, your experience with your doctors of being dismissed or minimized. And, you know, and I, and I see that, I see that in the workplace too. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's like, one of the things that's coming up for me um, is, you know, people will say, but what's the, like, how much do you tolerate? Hmm. Like, how much do you accept, right? That somebody needs to be out Mm -hmm. and resting for every 10 minutes right. for every five minutes that they're working what's right. that balance and and like I hear that and I really struggle with that from a humanity perspective yeah. of but if if when they can give me their full selves and I get that god that is feels like an even bigger gift well I think it makes the case for diversity too you yeah. know because we're not talking about just you know racial diversity we're talking about ability diversity as yeah. well you know because it would be hard for me to lead a team of a bunch of people who have the same exact gifts and limitations that I have. Um, one, we would just not be great at performing if we have the same challenges and same strengths. Um, this is part of why, you know, I, what I, what the sort of dependability and reliability I need because I'm unable to be as dependable and reliable yeah. in the traditional sense is a little different, you know, but, but what do I bring? And I really appreciate that you made this point about like how you're, you're, you're dependable, you're reliable when it comes to being there for people, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, and I, I think that that's where I, that's how I'm searching. Like I'm searching mm. to find within myself and be very cognizant of this. When I look at other people, when I think about other people, you know, what do people bring um, yeah. instead of, and, and I think it's easy when you have a chronic disease um, that, you know, certainly comes with its share of mental health issues as well, which just exacerbates this issue right. to be hyper-focused on what you can't do. And, um, that's because mm, that's what, mm. you know, the reliability and dependability conversation we're having is exactly that, you know, like I constantly feel like, oh gosh, I'm not as reliable and dependable as I know I would be if I could, you know, and as I know is expected of me, um, I'm not as a friend as reliable and dependable. I'm not as reliable and dependable, you know, for my kids, unless I really, really reclaim the, the terms and define them in my own way, mm. the way you just did. But that hyper focus on what I'm not is just so it just it happens so easily because that's how we're seen. Like when we talk about the premium placed, it's that our culture prioritizes and overvalues these certain aspects of us and undervalues the heart that people like you mm. and I bring. Right. Like when we show up, we show up in a way that. Um, it's like why people enjoyed that last episode of us together. It's why right. I feel like you and I immediately go beneath the skin, you know, because there's, there's a courage, there's a connection that's felt deeper. And I think that's something we bring that maybe other people don't bring. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with anybody. It's just, we all yeah. have our different skill sets. So I've been trying to make the point to myself because I need this point made to me and I mm. don't have people enough people making this point. So that's where I think 
you know, community comes in. When we talk about how people can support those of us who struggle with chronic illness, chronic disease, um, chronic pain, you know, don't just look at what we aren't, you know, Mm. don't let us just look at what we aren't look at what we are. And some Mm. of what I am is much of what I am. I will not say it's because of my chronic disease. I will say that my chronic disease has shown a spotlight on certain aspects of who I am that I would not have necessarily been able to see as clearly, you know, like my tenacity, um, like I'm still appreciating about myself, but I think there's such a lack of appreciation of who we are when we can't show up in the traditional, reliable and dependable ways. We're just like, you know, crossed out instead of like, what is the magic that these people bring that other people don't bring? Yeah. And it, you know, the thing that was coming up for me as you were talking is how fine of a line that could feel between that and toxic positivity, right? Like, yeah, and, and, and so what I true. mean by that is, right, like how you might approach it of, yep. of if you have someone in your life who maybe you're listening to this and going, oh, I want to help them see what they bring. Mm-hmm. And what, what would it look like to say, you know, instead of, well, look at the bright side, yeah. you're, ten- you're tenacious you're, yeah, now, totally. you're this, like, no. <laughs> no, no, no. But to say, but to say, I imagine this is really hard for you. And I, I can appreciate or imagine that you might get stuck looking at all the things you're not doing. Can, can I share with you all the things you are doing? And how powerful that would feel to receive that and how uh. powerful that would feel to say, you know, you, you are incre- incredibly tenacious you are you have a resilience even when you don't feel like you do Mm -hmm. you do right and so what would what does it look like to pour into each other not not to remove the discomfort with the uncertainty the Mm -hmm. suffering and the struggle but to pour in so that we can I don't you know like still be connected to our our whole selves what that looks like at that time right or in that in that that mode Yeah, I think like, you know, what I'm hearing and I agree with is this like invalidation that happens because people see it as an instead situation, like a but or Mm. it's one or the other. And and you said a word just as a matter of course that was quietly said that I want to amplify, which is and. Mm. And I think if people can believe both, you know, believe that I suffer a lot. I suffer on a daily basis more than many of them could imagine. You know, I'm in pain right now. Like, if, and um, I still, I still grasp and hold on to life. You know, mm-hmm. and I'm resilient, and I'm tenacious. But this idea that both are true, and yeah. I think where people feel like they're trying to dismiss minimize or invalidate without realizing that's what they're doing, Mm -hmm. but they are trying to, because it's uncomfortable for them. They're trying to like, let's quiet that down. It's like, you cannot quiet that down. That is there. Acknowledge it and acknowledge this as well. So I think there's the and piece of it. And then the other thing, when you were talking about resilience, um, and I didn't come up with this. I, I saw someone say it I don't even know where. And it, it, I'm like, that's it. I, and, and I've started to adopt that is that you are so resilient and I wish you didn't have to be. <sighs> right? You are so tenacious. I wish you didn't have to be. You're so strong. I wish you didn't have to be. Because the truth is like, this, yeah. this is not a gift this, this situation gives us. You know, we're, we're not, at least that's how I feel. Everyone, you know, deals with things differently. For me, it does not help me to be like, well, well, at least I have the gift of tenacity, right? Like this is the gift of the situation. It's like, this is a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I am resilient. I wish I didn't have to be. It's not fair. Life is not fair. And um, I'm not going to just accept this in a way that I'm not going to keep fighting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a... (laughs) Boy, that, yeah, you're resilient and I wish you didn't have to be. Yeah. is really powerful. And, and the and, you know, I know I've had moments of like crying to Nick and being like, I know I'm going to learn a lot from this. 
Like, I know there, I know I'm going to come on the other side. Yeah. I know that. I was like, but I'm fucking tired of learning. And exactly. I'm tired of like, it's like, I'm, I'm tired. I'm just tired. And I know, I know things will like, you know, in my situation, right? Like with my mental health and my, you know, new diagnosis with OCD, I'm like, mm -hmm. I get it. I know, I know that I'm learning. I know it's going to open up my capacity for other people. I get all of that. Yeah. And it sucks right now, totally. <laughs> like, you know, and and I know there will come a point where I, I will be able to even more confidently and compassionately and maybe courageously hold both of those things yeah. of this is the grief and here's what I've gained. And 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 those those go hand in hand. Yeah. And um, and just holding space for all of that. Right. Which, again, goes so beautifully back to how do, I just feel like that's the question as being a human. How do we navigate hope, expectations and despair? I think that. Yeah. And I think the first thing is like understanding that there is despair and that's where yeah. most people get stuck until they've been in a situation of despair that is not acute, you know, yeah. um, that is more chronic. I definitely think that for me, that's, that's, that's where it's at too. It's, you know, how do we, how do we navigate it in a world that does not leave room for despair? Yeah. That, that, that actually does not want to see despair. Yeah. It's so I, isolating, you know, it's so I, isolating I, to be in despair and to, to not be seen. And if people can't see your despair, they're not going to sufficiently help you either. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that your world has gotten a little smaller that you, you don't have to answer that, but like, yeah. it's definitely gotten smaller, but it's also gotten bigger in some ways. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I've plugged into the chronic migraine community for better and worse. Like there are times that it really bums me out. I mean, Thanksgiving week, I think we lost three people mm -hmm. uh, who died by suicide. And, you know, it's such a reminder of the suffering that this illness brings and, and the amount of pain people are in. And so being in the community, like it really was, I, I was a wreck, you know, for yeah. a few weeks, just, I don't even know these people, but I know them, you know, like yeah. I know they're doing yeah. And so, and I get it, I get why. I get why. Yeah. And so, mm. you know, there's that kind of piece of it that sometimes can make my life day to day a little harder, but to be seen and understood in a way that I, I'm not in my other communities um, is important. I think what's really where I'm still struggling is the multiple marginalization, right? Because I can mm. find, so, so I found I've lost a lot of people who weren't, as I started to become more public about my, my illness, the impact of it and my needs. Um, people were like, peace out, can't meet your needs. And I'm like, yeah, no, there's not room for that because yeah. if you can't accept me with my needs, you're not really accepting me and I don't belong. Right. So I've had a lot of heartbreak this past year. Um, but I've also very cautiously, you know, have welcomed new people into my life that I don't know if they'll get it. Um, certainly the migraine community, there are people who get it. I'm just not like super close with people, yeah. but I have yeah. other people who are not part of the migraine community who's, who so far seem to be, you know, a lot more, um, willing to acknowledge that part that you were talking about that mm. people often just try to be like, Oh, just, you know, just focus on the positive so that, that there's some hope there. Um, for me, it's been interesting. The intersectionality continues to be a real struggle because, you know, I will have conversations with other, you know, Asian American women. Um, but, you know, I'm an Asian American woman with a disability. Yeah. And, and that, that makes my experience different. And so there's a disconnect there. Like there's not like, I haven't found my community of Asian American women with disabilities, you know? So I think it's, um, the more marginalized you are, it can be hard to really find a place that you are understood and you can share lived experiences. Yeah. I mean, it just feels like another stone stacked. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit is yep. like the image that was coming up for me. Yep. How... How how do you want to be supported or maybe how has somebody supported you in a way that was really powerful? Because I think that, you know, again, sometimes people think they're doing the right thing. You know, I'm mm -hmm. like, I've gotten to a point in my life when, you know, it's usually my mom. I love her. But usually yeah. it's like, Sam, <laughs> Sam, don't worry about it. I'm like, I... 
I'm going to, mom, I love you. And I know you're trying to be helpful, (laughs) but I'm telling you that in this moment, that's actually not helpful. Right. Like, here's what I need. Right. And I've just gotten like, and it's not, I'm not like accusing her or judging her because I know it comes from this beautiful place and I don't want you to suffer or struggle anymore. Right. So I'm going to do this. So what, what has that, either what has that support looked like in a way that was like, oh, this is what I needed Mm -hmm. or what might it look like? Uh, I could go on about this forever. I have written about this. So um, I will send you the uh, piece that just recently was published. Um, It was about when I went to a conference and I hadn't been to a conference in years, you know, Mm. over the course of the pandemic and my migraine being so flared up. And I went to a conference and it was the first time, you know, since I started being more and more, I've never hidden my, my disability and my disease, but I've been very intentionally, very public about it over the past year for myself and as an advocate and, you know, for advocacy purposes. So I wrote this piece about kind of what went right as far as receiving Mm. community support. And I'm happy to share that with the listeners. Um, so, um, I'm going to also talk about what hasn't gone right, because I think Mm, that that can help people understand what could go right. I think one big thing that I worry about a lot and I've experienced is that we are not taught in our culture how to understand and support in a chronic way. We are taught how Mm -hmm. to deal with things acutely. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I have a disease, you know, as it sounds like you are struggling with similar things that are not acute. They may ebb and flow in different mm-hmm. ways. They can be better managed at some times, but they don't magically just, oh, yeah, had a week of that over now, yeah. you know? <laughs> and it's so strange because literally, like, you know, through the pandemic, people are like free, not to, COVID has been terrible. COVID has been terrible. Yeah. But it's been interesting. You would think it would give people a window. I feel like you're one of the only people who connected the dots. You know, mm. when you struggled and you were like, I am, you, you put those, you had those COVID glasses on and you were like, now I can envision a mm-hmm. little bit of what it's like for people with chronic diseases. And that is not what most people did. You know, like I think people were sick. Some people were very sick and it was like, um, it's done now. You know, those who were lucky enough to not have long COVID. And I think that's how we are, we are raised to be that way. And it, it means that like we talked about earlier in this conversation, people are waiting for me to just get better. And it feels like the support, doesn't doesn't sustain um because they're just that's just not, people don't know how to sustain and and yet my suffering sustains yeah. you know and so yeah. how many times am i going to like let people know i'm still suffering like it's it's taxing yeah. for me to keep yeah. saying the same thing over and over and then he, so so one i think people need to really try to wrap their brains around chronic illness and and think about when they do have an acute illness, actually think to themselves, what would it be like if I felt like this every single day and there was no cure? And literally I, I have a lifetime ahead of this, of ahead of me of this, like really think that. And I have a friend who has texted me at times. She's like, you know, I just had a really bad headache or I had a really bad migraine on Sunday. And I, I just was thinking about you. I was thinking about my Mm. God, like, how do I make, you know, it was so terrible to be in that moment that day. And what must it be like for you? Right. So like, we can't imagine it's true. No one will understand. I can't understand yeah. exactly what your life is like in your struggle. You can't understand mine, but we can try our best. You know, we can, we can be there for one another without conflating our challenges. So I think if people can bear to try to imagine, and even if they can't bear, push themselves to bear to try Mm. to imagine, because I don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. You know, we're stuck with this. We don't even have to imagine. And then I think also, I have done a lot of writing this past year about my experience um, with chronic migraine. I've started using a hashtag, chronic migraine chronicles, on Twitter, X, whatever the hell it is. <laughs> on um, Facebook, on even on LinkedIn, which LinkedIn, was, yeah, that's where that, I see that your was stuff. a big. That was a big. Um, that one was hard for me to like mm. be like. I'm gonna own this among my prospective clients because I knew there was yeah. gonna be people who were like, oh, we don't want to hire her. She's not gonna mm-hmm. be dependable, you know. Even though I show up every dang time for every single thing I commit to, but um, 
I think that um, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Well, we were talking yeah. about like ways people have supported you oh, yes. in good ways and ways that they haven't. So when someone shares their experience, engage with it. So here's my fear. My fear is this podcast episode goes out with a title about chronic illness and a bunch of people are like, oh, I'm not going to listen to that one. That one's not yeah. for me. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. it's the same thing. Not the same thing, but similar with other aspects of diversity. You know, we see the same, similar things happen. As we were talking, I was thinking about how similar this is to like the racial diversity issues that I've struggled with, you know, like this idea of, oh, just be thankful for what you have. That toxic positivity that's applied in racial, um, along racial aspects as well. Like, oh, you had to struggle. That's what made you so brave. Yeah, it's yeah. like, I don't, great. I'm brave, but I wish I didn't have to be and I yeah, shouldn't have yeah, to be. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. similar sort of thing here, you know, um, this isn't a conversation for you and for me, although of course it is because I love talking to you. My hope is this part of the conversation, particularly is for people who don't struggle with the issues we struggle with. And my worry is those people are not going to be listening to this. Yeah, and it's yeah. you and me preaching to the choir, so to speak, because that's what I see happen a lot with what I put out on social media. You know, it's like crickets. And it's so scary as a person mm. with a disability that brings me to tears mm. most days to put something personal out there and literally have nobody respond to it. I'm like, wow, I am really alone, you know? And and it's not that people are like, F her, you know, yeah. it's that I think one, there's the algorithm, which is problematic. Yeah. And two, yeah. two, people don't see it as their issue or, or right. three, people right. are tired of hearing me complain about it, quote unquote. Right. They're right. really tired of me, but I'm like, I'm tired of having chronic migraine, you know, but it's not going away. So yeah. If I'm stuck with it, you're stuck with hearing about it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's tough because I see it happen with other people I follow on social media too. Yeah. Like we don't see these issues as ours. It's the same thing with, you know, um, I mean, George Floyd. I mean, I think about George Floyd going, I literally just had a conversation about that moment in history. And it's like, if you don't see George Floyd as yours, if you don't see George yeah. Floyd as your family, you're not going to activate. And right. And we do this. We don't. We don't, we don't actually activate until it's our problem. Hmm. And, and that's what happens in all these areas of diversity. We don't, we don't really, like, that's not for me. It's like, no, it's actually exactly for you. Yeah. That's a, uh, yeah, but I'm going to definitely like hold on to that because, you know, it's, it's, it's true. And it, and it takes uh, an intentionality to say, I'm going to learn about this. And sometimes it's not until it's right. It's kind yeah, of the whole right like what, what's what's near to you becomes dear to you, and and how do you make more stuff become near to you? But right? even Which, friends, you know, like mm -hmm. even friends, like for me, I need to know when I share an article with friends, like, hey, I wrote this piece, you know, about my disability, that they read it. I need them to circle yeah. back, either respond to the article wherever I posted it, or circle back and be like, I read it. You know, I'm hearing you. Think, you know, like. But when I don't hear back, I don't know that they read it. And yeah. it's really hard because for me, this is me and everyone has their own journey. I'm trying to make meaning of my struggle. This is how I personally make meaning of it is like, all right, I'm going to get involved in advocacy. I'm going to share. I'm going to try to make this world more inclusive. I'm going to connect it. It's connected to my work. It's connected to my mission as a human, but to, to not, and, and, and I need to be seen by the people who yeah. care about me to not get that. Like, let me, Oh, I want to eagerly read it and respond. It's that really, 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 really hurts me. Sure. Yeah. And I, and I would imagine like feels even more like invisible right exactly. especially That's especially exactly when you're it. like you know i it's it, it it's like i mean that gosh that point you made about we don't know how to show up for chronic illness chronic yeah. pain chronic suffering i mean i i remember uh, a a dear friend of mine he passed away very suddenly at 50 and his his widow was like a month later she said everybody wants me to be over it yeah yep and you know and like Everybody, you know, it's, it's, it's similar. Like what's that? Very similar. You know, there's something about, I don't know, this, this is going to make sense. There's something 
about the human experience is sort of like a game of endurance. And what mm. does it look like to endure together, right? Like, how do we share the burden together? I mean, I sit there and I think, because even when you just have one or two people who, even if they don't get it, right? Like, even if they don't understand it explicitly, but are like, but I'm walking with you, I'm going to, you know, I think about Nick. Nick endures a lot with me, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and I like to think that, you know, when he needs me to hold the burden too, I hold it with him. And it is, yeah, I don't know. I'm not I, I think sure you're what totally, my thoughts are, but. First of all, you just did like a million freaking mic drop moments. And what you just said, <laughs> you're going to go back and listen to it and have like a zillion quotes to put on t-shirts because that was. After, after system, 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 <laughs> it's system, it's, exactly. it's systemic, it's systemic, it's systemic. You Boom. are going to get a mug with that. I'm going to like email Amy ah, right away hilarious. and be like, we got to get a mug made for Neha. <laughs> you have to have one too, because it's ours together. I will. <laughs> Talk about together, right? I mean, I think that's been the big struggle. That's been one of the struggles for me too, is exactly what you said is like, how do we, how do we suffer together? How do we yeah. struggle together? And how do we go through something with someone? And yeah. that's where I feel like our American culture is just the opposite of that. It's super yeah. individualistic and not yep. communal. And mm -hmm. that for people who have chronic illness is a huge, huge problem. I, I literally, there's a song. I'm going to have to like give my props to Depeche Mode. There is a really great Depeche Mode song. There are many great Depeche Mode songs, but yeah, Ju I was gonna Judas, say, list one. Yeah. Judas is a really great song that as I've been struggling with exactly the point yeah. you were talking about that the lyrics really speak to this about how, you know, let me put it this way. Abled people, um, do things based on convenience. Mm. I don't have the luxury of doing things based on convenience. Mm. I do things based on survival. Mm. And when I have needs, oftentimes people will not show up for those needs based on their convenience. <sighs> and it's so hard for me to, you know, what, what I really want, it appears is too much to ask, which is like, can you, can you give something? I have to give things up every day of my life. I'm giving things up. Would you mind giving up? one thing today mm. to be able to like help me out. And mm. I think I don't, I, I think it's just how our culture is, you know, this identity, this idea that it's the privilege conversation that you and I have yeah. had before too. Right. Where it's yeah. like, they don't yeah. understand. I, I think they don't understand that. Like, I don't get to make decisions based on convenience. Like my need is so dire. And when I see that they can't show up for my need because they, you know, are going to do whatever that's like a luxury that I can't even dream about doing. That's hard. Cause then I feel like you're not with me. You're not willing to lose anything. Yeah. And I'm losing every day, every moment so much. And I'm care. I'm having to carry that for the most part on my own. I'm being slightly hyperbolic. Cause it's not like they're not willing to do anything, Sure, but no. there's, a, there's not this idea that I'll, I'll walk the hard path with you. Mm -hmm. You know, my life will also be hard because I will walk the hard path with yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there's this, <laughs> this movie, and it's going to seem like a really strange, like, what was it? Midsummer. It's like a horror hmm. film. I don't know if you've seen it. I have not. Anyway, seen it. it's it's a strange movie for me to be referencing. But there's a scene where the main mm -hmm. character, the main female character, she she experiences an incredible amount of loss. I want to explain why. Okay. But all of these women in mm -hmm. this sort of like strange, right, like mm -hmm. <laughs> culture, um, mourn with her wow. and they are breathing with her and they're crying with her wow. and and i and and in the context of the movie it's like cr they, they present it as creepy yeah right like yeah. it's supposed to be unsettling yeah. but when i was watching that scene wow. i went what would that be like oh my god that if if somebody was in a moment of despair if somebody was in that moment of grief like just pouring out and we all just like we just met them and we were holding it with like, I just, I'm getting goosebumps. And again, like in the context of the film, it's, I don't, I think, I think they intended to have a different reaction. But when I saw that, I was like, shit, that's what I want in my life. That's how I want to try to show up yeah. for folks. Like, how do I show up? You know, and I'm not always great at it, right? Like mm, I've got that. Either. I'm part of the system and it's oh, in yeah, my DNA. Like, I mean, I get excited when my neighbors asks me to like water her plants. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> let's be in community together. Like, come, 
I have a cup of sugar whenever you need it, right? Like I get excited about that because it doesn't, it just doesn't exist in our very like, right? As suburban has spread out, as right families have separated, as third places have ceased to exist and right. And also just the sheer individual uh, nature of our culture. It, 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 it's just so isolating. And you know, the other thing that I can't help but reflect on as we're talking, I feel so, so incredibly fortunate um, to have colleagues who mm-hmm. I feel like will share the burden with me. Like, and I think we do that really well with each other. So yeah. as people are listening to this, and I know we have a lot of folks who are in leadership or HR, It's important for us to have that community, you know, outside of work, but also realize you can build that community inside of work, too, which is critical because that's where you're spending most of your time. So I'm just having a moment of appreciation for my colleagues. I I feel that, too. I mean, that's why that piece I wrote, you know, it was with colleagues. But yeah, I mean, I need to write a piece about friends, too, because as much as I feel like things could be different, you know, and how we as a culture show up for one another. And my gosh, that movie was like, I totally, what a beautiful way to express what exactly what I was trying to say. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's it's, it's it. super like, not to be clear. I'm not, I'm not like recommending. It's a really <laughs> fucked up movie. <laughs> it's really messed up. It's like super psychologically uncomfortable. It's a lot of things. But just that one little yes, scene, yes, yes. <laughs> because I don't want people to be like, oh, I'm going to watch this movie and it's going to, no, it's yeah. horrifying. It's terror. It's, it's horrifying. But they got <laughs> but one that, thing right. That but that mean scene <laughs> was so interesting. Yeah. So, so anyway, I feel That's like I so need true. to do a, like it's... a caveat there. Because <laughs> people <laughs> have seen so the cute. movie are like, why is she bringing it up when that we're talking so about funny. this? But <laughs> well, I appreciate at least that one little part, even though they probably didn't intend it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I think you're totally right. I think that we need this in our in our workspaces, connections that are mutually supportive. Yeah. Understanding that this type of support I need may be different than the type of yeah. support you need in this yeah. moment, a moment from now. Um, but I feel like I've, you know, really discovered in a lot of ways through this journey, you know, who is there for me? You know, as much as I've lost people, I've also like come to appreciate um, people who have shown up in incredibly compelling ways. I mean, it's, yeah. I literally had, I have a friend who literally has checked on me e- every single day for mm. probably at least the past six months, probably beyond that every single day, you know, and, and asking the question, like you asked just the way you put it, um, how, how would you like to be supported? How did one friend put it to me? Oh, what would nurture you in this moment? Oh, I love that. And I really, yeah. really love that. And I think it's for me, sometimes it's the little things. It's understanding that my limitations are not just like big things. Um, but it's the little things like one of my friends came over and took me out to dinner because I never go out, you know, anymore. And that in itself was lovely to just spend time with someone. Yeah. And then when we got back, my bag was on the floor of her car and I was getting out of the car mm. and I went to reach for my bag and she's like, let me get it. Let me get it. Like just mm. such a simple gesture of mm. like reaching down to get my bag. You know, um, I think it's, it's reminding me that I'm not holding you to our plans. Like, I know you want to be there. It's things like, um, I had a group of friends who were going to dinner together that I'm a group of. And I, I was like, I don't know if I'm able to make it because of my migraine. And later I realized, oh, and I told them, I'm like, what you could do in the future is if I can't make it, bring me back something. Yeah. You know, like, don't just make it that I miss out on everything. I'm going to feel sad and be crying at home that I can't be with you all that I'm left out. But at least come by and bring me the food. Yeah. You know, think of activities that I can do and yeah. bring bring those activities to me, you know, because I need connection too. I need to feel like I belong as well. So it's all sorts of things from checking in. Um, oh my gosh, doctor's appointments, like you know, I, you know, if you have a friend who could use help, like getting to and from doctor's appointments, mm, mm. that's huge. The checking in after a doctor's appointment, how did it go? Cause 
interacting with the medical system, as we talked about earlier, it's incredible. It's honestly traumatic for me. Yeah. And for many people, yeah. it's traumatic. And so I often find myself having a lot of emotional needs going into those appointments and coming out. Um, but I think even just asking the question and sometimes just act without asking, sometimes just show up and give your friend a hug. You know, yeah. just yeah. show up and don't ask, what can I do? What can I do? Yeah. Just show up and be with, like you said, walk the path with them. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, and I think that like, you know, the only thing I would add to that is just like an, an offer it, right? Like, Hey, would it be helpful if, yes. you know, I know one time we were going through, we had lost a couple of This is during the pandemic and we had lost a couple of family members. And I remember Teresa texted me and mm -hmm. said, carbs can be healing. So do you have any issues with me dropping off some cinnamon bread? And I'm like, no. And it was just such a glorious, right? Like instead yeah. of asking, instead of, and, and just those little things. And I think part of it is trust, trust that the thing that's coming up for me is, and trust that you'll tell the person if it's not right. That's right. Right. Like, like, you know, maybe, maybe I think I'm being helpful by reaching for the bag. Mm -hmm. You're like, no, actually I need to, you know, learn to do it or whatever, yeah. but just like trust that they will, they'll, they'll guide you in yeah. what is going to be most supportive. And, um, and then, you know, and that's so true. Don't be scared to help because you're scared. You're going to like give them the wrong thing. Yeah. You know, I think that's huge. I mean, it's, it really goes to difficult conversations and, um, like I, I think of it with migraine, like people don't know what triggers my migraines. So I think it yeah. holds some people back from sending things. It's like, it's okay. You can ask me, you could be like, yeah. I'm thinking about sending this, but would that make your migraine worse or might it help soothe you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, um, I love you. I love you too. You're so I wish, cool. I mean, I wish we, I, you know, it's the, I've had this thought before. I'm like, I just want to sit on the couch and you can just like keep your eyes covered and I can just can like, just hang. I don't know, just hang and just sit in silence together because sometimes I think we don't do that enough either of just like, so just true. coexisting. Like we don't even, don't always need to go out to dinner or do something yeah. like I, I love I love the moments with people and usually it's family, right? Yeah. But I, I would love to have more friends where we just exist together. Like you just come yeah. over and we watch TV. So anyway, yeah. I wish, I wish, I mean, this is just, you know, hi everyone. This is Neha and Sarah time. Yeah. Like, I just want to exist with you, Neha. I'm I, so, I'm so grateful for you. I feel the same way. And I think, um, there's something really beautiful about that. I just want to exist with you. Something very meaningful to my heart. Um, and I also kind of more practically speaking, want to say that I've had to learn how to do that with some friends, you know, like, sure, and, sure. but it's been so freeing to do that. Like I just traveled with one of my dearest friends, the one who calls me, you know, checks in on me yeah. every single day. Um, we traveled for a weekend together and usually we fill our time. We've so much to talk about. We've been friends for a lifetime, but like we've had to learn how to have those silences because I have chronic migraine. She has like episodic migraine. Yeah. And we're like, it's okay. Like, it's okay. We can be together and enjoy our togetherness without filling that space hmm. with words, you know? But it, it was something that I think took some practice because that's not how we ever were. Mm -mm. Um, mm -mm. But what a beautiful notion. What a beautiful, vulnerable that. notion. Yeah. That's a... Uh... Uh, well, we can clearly continue talking and we'll just have you on again and, you know, we'll I'll explore some other <laughs> some other topic. But um, I'm so grateful for you and I'm so grateful that you were willing to come on and talk about your experience. And, you know, and hopefully we can get more folks to listen to this. Right. Like, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying earlier of like, we don't want to just preach the choir. We want to preach to the people who are supporting the choir. <laughs> like, exactly. Exactly. You know, so this we'll is do all our... of our issue. Right. Right. Like, we don't right. carry our illnesses as individuals. We carry them mm. as communities um thank you mm. so much there you're you're truly a gift and um you bring out you help me know myself better um and you really just pull wisdom out of both of us i feel like so Aww. thank you so much you're wonderful well, thank you i adore you likewise our guest this week has been neha sumput and they're I just always leave so fulfilled by these conversations. But some of the things that I'm definitely holding on to is that idea of how much of a premium we put on dependability and reliability and how that can exclude folks, um, depending on what they can offer and how do we 
How do we help people bring their whole selves, whatever that looks like? So um, for those of you who want to know how to connect with Neha, we will be sure to put her contact information in the show notes along with the articles that she referenced. Please be sure to follow her on LinkedIn or on your preferred social media platform so you can see all the great work that she's putting out. And we want to hear from you. You can reach out to us at podcast at sarahnollwilson.com and let us know what resonated for you, what uh, maybe you have a story that you're navigating or you love someone who's navigating a chronic illness, please do not hesitate to reach out. Also, my DMs are always open on my social media platforms. And if you'd like to support the show, please be sure to rate, review and subscribe to the show on your preferred podcast platform that helps us get exposure and bring on great guests and explore topics like the one we did today with Neha. Also, you can become a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash conversations on conversations where you'll get access to ad free shows, early episodes, as well as some pretty great swag. And your financial contribution will support the incredible team that makes this happen. So speaking of them, let's give some love to our incredible team that makes this show possible. To our producer, Nick Wilson, to our sound editor, Drew Knoll, our transcriptionist, Becky Reinert, our marketing consultant, Jessica Burge, and the rest of the Snowco crew. And just a final big wholehearted big hug from Iowa. Thank you to Neha Samput for showing up with courage and helping us learn how to do the same. This has been Conversations on Conversations. Thank you all so much for listening. And remember, when we can change the conversations we have with ourselves and others, we can change the world. So until next week, please be sure to rest, rehydrate, and we'll see you again soon.